Okay, then let's get into topic for today, which is kind of a little bit of a bridge. Last two sermons, we looked at the two brothers in Luke 15, and next time we will look at uh, the wonderful topic of freedom in Christ. But the challenge is, or not really a challenge, but what I want to do today is I want to kind of bridge those two topics, because there is a very important question that I believe many people do not really have a biblical answer for, and that is simply the question, how can I know, truly know, that I'm saved? And like I said, it's a standalone. Today is a standalone, and of course next time is also a standalone. But today is kind of a little bit of a bridge between the two topics, and hopefully it will help some people as well then to really fully understand, uh, or understand in a deeper way, what we will talk about next time. So, Many Christians struggle with this question, and they say, well, if you ask them the question, are you saved, they will give you a yes, and then you ask them why, and then you get a question mark on their face. And they will give answers like, well, someone told me, or they will point at a certain Bible verse, or they will say, well, I prayed a sinner's prayer, or something like this. But it's really something that doesn't really come from their heart, it's some, more something that someone else told them. Some people, they say, well, I'm safe because I prayed a sinner's prayer. Some people go to the other extreme. They say, you'll never know in this life. Just try your best today, and then when you die, then you'll see whether you were good enough. Other people in more legalistic churches, they go more to the extreme of, well, these are the rules, and if you follow them, and if you're good enough, then you're a Christian, then you're saved. But if we are honest, that has really nothing to do with Christianity, and that has nothing to do with what Jesus actually taught. And reality is simply this. Many people think they are saved, but when they actually meet Jesus one day, they will find out they are not. <clears throat> Matthew 7 is one of those passages that talks about this. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Jesus speaking, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then, I, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity. This is a very obvious passage where people did a lot of good stuff in the name of Jesus. They did a lot of good works. They were active in the church. They were telling other people about Jesus. They were doing a lot of great stuff in the name of Jesus. But then in the end, when they actually meet Jesus, Jesus will tell them, no, you're not my child, and you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So obviously, a self-declaration, simply saying about myself, I am a Christian, doesn't make me a Christian at all. <clears throat> At the core of this challenge is obviously a very, very difficult question, and that's the relationship between faith and works. It's something the church has been struggling with for the last 2,000 years, and the church has been going back and forth, and different denominations, different church groups have swung towards extremes. Many people think that once they pray a sinner's prayer, they are automatically bound to go to heaven. They picked verses like, for by grace you are saved through faith, not that of, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. John 3.16, most famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So some people kind of take these verses completely out of context, ignore the rest of the Bible, and they simply say, I believe that Jesus is God, I believe in my head that he died for my sin, and so nothing else matters. I can live a wild life, I can do with my money whatever I want. I can do sexual, with sexual, in the area of sexuality whatever I want. I don't care about relationships, forgiveness, or anything. I pray the sinner's prayer. I believe that Jesus is God, so I am good. That's one extreme. And then other people try to earn their salvation. 
and they take other verses completely out of context. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. A few verses later, you see then <coughs> how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And then it says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And then some people will take these verses completely out of context and they simply say, well, I have to be a good person. And so I kind of need to qualify. The problem there, of course, is they never know when am I good enough, but they simply say, like, I have to reach a certain standard and I have to be good enough and only God knows whether I'm good enough. And then if I'm, once I'm dying, then if I reach that level, then I will make it to heaven. So they don't really trust in Jesus. They don't really trust in forgiveness or anything. They simply trust in their works and they simply say, I have to be good enough. The problem, as I mentioned, is they will never know whether they are good enough. And very often these people have a still small voice in the back of their mind saying, am I really saved? Am I really good enough? Am I really right with God? Some churches over the last 2,000 years go towards one extreme and they are very free in an unhealthy way. Other churches go towards the other extreme and they are very legalistic in an unhealthy way. And of course you can find within the spectrum anywhere in, anywhere in the spectrum you can find all kinds of churches that lean towards one or the other extreme or anywhere in between. So is that a contradiction? Because one verse says faith alone, the other verse says not faith alone. Now I don't claim to have a perfect answer, but I do believe that the answer is not either or, but the answer is simply both. Here is how I believe how we can, how we can bring together these two principles. I believe the first principle is this. Yes, salvation is by faith alone. Remember when God called Abraham? Even in the Old Testament, some people think that there's a difference between the Old and the New Testament. There's none. How was Abraham saved? God called him and said, I'll make you into a great nation. And Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. He was saved by faith, not by his works. Remember the criminal crucified with Jesus? What did he do on the cross? He believed that Jesus is a righteous man. He believed that Jesus is God's son. He had no time to do any works or to prove his faith or anything. He believed in him there and he was saved. John 3.16, we just read it. Whosoever believes in Jesus shall not perish but have eternal life. I personally am convinced that the moment we believe that Jesus is God, that he died for our sins, and that he took all our sins, at that moment, we are saved. But here is now where James come in, comes in. The other verses that I just read. <coughs> if we truly believe that Jesus is God, we will live differently. We will not live the same any longer. James 2, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, off, offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See how faith worked with his works. And by works was faith, faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified not by faith alone. Likewise, this also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Basically, what James is saying here is there is an evidence of our faith. There is a way in which we can prove that we truly believe, and that is our works, our lifestyle our decisions, what we choose to do and what we choose to not do. Let me give you an analogy on this whole thing. 
My kids. I love my kids. That's why I discipline them. Disciplining kids is evidence of my love for them. If I don't care about kids, I don't tell them what they should do. I don't tell them what they shouldn't do. If I don't have love for them, then why would I put my time and my energy into investing in them, into these kids, and helping them to grow in the right way? If I don't love them, I'll say, well, it's your life. I don't care about your life. I'll just care about myself. I love my kids, and 20 years from now, when I'm not living with them any longer, I want them to have a good life. I want them to know what is right and wrong. I don't want them to get in trouble with the police. I want them to follow God. I want them to love God, and I want them to have a good family life, good marriage, and all these things. And because I love them, and I want them to have a good future, that's why I'm training them today. And that's why I'm teaching them today things that hopefully they will then embrace when, they, when I don't live with them any longer. My actions towards my kids, my discipline towards them, is evidence of my love for them. Now, the one thing I cannot do is I cannot make myself a father by disciplining other people's kids. Angelo, I cannot go to your kids and discipline them so much and one day say, now you have become my child. It doesn't work that way. Disciplining a child doesn't make you a father, doesn't make you a mother, doesn't make you a parent. But if you are a parent, then disciplining them shows that you are in a parent-child relationship and that you love them and that you care for them. If I don't discipline my kids, it probably shows that I don't really love them the way I'm supposed to love them, being their father. My identity as a father comes first. My actions towards my children flow out of that identity, out of my love. Actions are evidence of my love for them and my identity, our relationship as a parent and a child. So back to the topic for today. True faith is confirmed by our actions. When we simply say, I believe that Jesus is God, yeah, that's a great start, but if we then don't act on it, then maybe we don't truly believe it. And maybe we don't really have the kind of faith that we say we have. So faith and works are not a contradiction. And if you look at these two passages, Paul and James look really at the same topic from two different sides of the coin. Paul, in those passages where he says, you're saved by faith alone, he is saying, the moment you have genuine faith in Jesus, you are saved. And you don't have to add works to it or anything. Just really believing, truly believing from your heart, at that moment, you are saved. And you are going to heaven. (coughs) James, on the other hand, looks at the same topic from a different angle. And he's saying, you say you have faith. Now, check your heart. Check your actions. And check whether what you say with your words is actually true. Whether you truly believe what you say you believe. It's not a contradiction. These two principles go hand in hand. Let me try to come at this whole topic from a whole different angle. Just imagine someone told you this. Someone came to you, whether it's a friend or maybe even a total stranger, and he tells you, I love you, I want the best for you, and I really care for you. Here's something I'm going to do for you. Not telling the truth really isn't good for you, because it hurts relationships, and it hurts you, and it hurts the other other people. So I don't want you to do this any longer. So here's the deal. I'll give you 10 million euro if for the next 12 months you always tell the truth. I wish the person came to me with that kind of offer, but just imagine that for the moment. How would you respond? Basically, there are th- I believe there are three different possibilities to respond. The first possibility is to say, I don't believe you. You're not going to give me that money anyways. 
So, and then to ignore the offer and to say, I'm not going to do it because there is no reward for me. I don't believe that you're say, telling the truth. I don't believe that you're giving me any money. So, no, thank you. And we just go on with our own life. That's one possibility. <clears throat> Another possibility is to say, well, I just want the reward. I just want the money. I don't really care about telling the truth. I don't really care about relationships or anything. But what I do care about is I want that money. So what I'm going to do is, for these next 12 months, I'm going to try my best. And maybe if I don't tell the truth here and there, I hope the other person is not going to find it out. But I'm going to try my best to get the reward. That's the second possibility. The third possibility is we could choose to obey out of trust. And we could say, you know, I believe you. And I believe what you are saying is true. And I believe, I trust you that, well, not telling the truth is really not good for me. I believe that you love me. I believe that you care for me. And that's why I'm going to obey. And that's the main reason why I'm going to be honest. I would obey you even if you didn't offer me any money. This 10 million that you offer me, that's a byproduct. It's nice to have, but that's not what I'm after. What I'm really after is simply this. I trust that you want the best for me. And I trust that when you tell me, always tell the truth, that it's actually good for me. So the second and the third one might look similar on the outside, but it's a very, very different heart attitude. Whether we just aim for the reward or the way that we obey because we truly trust. So let's compare this kind of offer with what God really offered us. God offered us something very similar, but much, much better. He told us, this honesty isn't good for you. It hurts you. It hurts other people. It hurts relationships. So don't do it. Be honest all the time. It's better for you. And you know what? On top of all of that, I give you something wonderful. I'll give you heaven. I'll take you to heaven. That's the reward. God's offer is similar to this person, this hypothetical person that I just mentioned to you. But his reward, obviously, is way, way greater than simply someone giving us 10 million euro. And now we have a choice to make. We can say, God, I don't trust you. I don't know whether lying is really bad. And I don't know if that's really what's best for me. And so our action of saying, I'm going to continue being dishonest, is a way of saying, I don't really trust you, Jesus. Some people, they obey out of duty, and they just want to want the reward. And they say, I just want to go to heaven. I don't really love Jesus. I don't really care about Jesus. But I do want to go to heaven. And so I'm just going to do it. But their heart isn't in it. Because there is no love and no trust in Jesus. Or we can say, Jesus... I trust you. I know that what you say is best. It's best for me. It's best for other people. It's best for society, for my friendships. It's best for everyone. And because I trust you, I'm going to obey. And you know, me going to heaven, that's great. That's wonderful. But even if there was no heaven, and even if there was no afterlife, I would still do it. Because I trust you. And I trust that what you tell me is best for me. Those are the three optional options of responses that we have. And I believe only the last one is real faith. Only the last one is genuine faith. Let's look at a few other examples. For example, <coughs> if someone says, I know what is best for you, and I want you to fully enjoy your life. I'll give you 10 million euro if you... Keep yourself 100% sexually pure for your husband, for your wife, or for your future husband, or for your future wife. 
how would we respond? Would we then say, okay, I'll do it? Or would we say like, uh, I still want to have fun, so forget about this money. How about if someone said, I'll give you 10 million euro if, if you give 10% of all your income to the church. Would we do it? Would we trust that person? Would we obey? What if someone said, I'll give you 10 million euro if you simply have a 15 minutes phone call with me each day talking about what's going on in your life. So we have a conversation. We have a re relationship with each other. And I just, I just want to hear how your life is going. Would we do that? If someone says, I'll give you 10 million euro if you stop complaining about your annoying co-worker and show love to me instead. Would we do that? Would we obey that and say, yeah, I want that money and I'm going to do what you tell me to do? It's a big question, I guess. But that's basically what God offered to us. Except that he didn't offer us money. He offered us something much, much better. He offered us heaven. So how do we respond to these offers from God? Do we say, I'm going to disobey. I'm not going to follow this. That's basically evidence that we don't really trust Jesus. Or we don't trust everything about him. May we believe that he is God, but maybe we don't believe that he wants the best for us. Or maybe there's something in our heart where we have to admit, you know, this is more important to me than God. An idol, basically. If we disobey, it shows that there is a lack of faith. If we obey out of duty... Simply because we say, well, I want to go to heaven. I don't really want to do it, but I just have to obey because I just want to make it to heaven one day. Then we don't really love Jesus. We don't really trust him either. We just want to get the reward. And I don't believe that if we have that kind of attitude, I don't think we are saved. Or we can say, God, I obey. I trust you. And even if there was no heaven, I would still do it, simply because I love you and simply because I trust that you want the best for me. That shows that we love God. That shows that we trust God. And that kind of attitude is genuine faith. One thing we may never forget is, of course, identity comes first, and then the actions follow. Back to the early analogy, I told you, I cannot discipline someone else's kids and then one day claim, I've disciplined you enough, now I can be your father. It doesn't work that way. The identity comes first, the actions follow. And so in the same way, we always have to remember, obedience to God cannot make us right. At least not in the first place. What makes us right with God is faith, it's not our works. But then we have to watch our actions and we have to watch our attitudes. Because in there then lies the key to figuring out whether we truly believe what we say we believe or whether we simply try to make ourselves feel good and kind of give ourselves uh, some confidence but deep down, our actions tell something else. And deep down, we have to admit, you know, my disobedience to God all this time kind of shows that I don't really trust him and love him the way I say I love him. Our actions can show a lack of faith. Outward obedience with a wrong, with a wrong heart attitude can also show that we don't really love God. Or our actions can then show that we have genuine faith and that we genuinely believe and trust in God and in his way. The trouble, of course, is we cannot conclude from our works to our faith for several reasons. First of all, <coughs> we know our, our own, ourself, we know our own works, but when we look at other people, we don't always know everything about them. What we tend to do is we tend to compare our weaknesses that only we know 
and our struggles that maybe happen and our disobedience that nobody else knows about, we compare that with the public works of someone else. And then we look at someone like Mother Teresa and we say, I can never be like that. Because all we know about someone like Mother Teresa is like the wonderful things that she did for the poor people all over the world. And no doubt that was an awesome work that she did. But we cannot compare the public life of another person like her and then compare that to, oh, at home I struggle with pornography. Oh, at home I have all these evil thoughts. So we cannot compare ourselves with other people because we simply don't know what they really do. And of course it's easy to say, like, okay, that person has given so much money to the church and I can only give so little, but maybe that person is rich and nobody knows. And actually that person doesn't care about giving 10,000 euro to a church because he just has a lot of money. So we simply don't know. We cannot compare our works with other people simply because we don't know all the works and all the circumstances that are go with another person doing all those works. We also cannot compare our works with someone else's works simply because we have been given different gifts. Remember the parable of the talents? One person was given five talents, one person was given two talents, one person was given one talent. The person with five talents was expected to bring back five more. The person with two talents was expected to bring back two more. And he got the same response. He was as faithful with his two talents as the other person with the five talents. So if we have been given more gifts, then our evidence of our faith has to be greater, simply because God is expecting more of us. And so that's why we cannot simply say, like, oh, that person is such a great preacher, that person is such a great worship leader, that person is so generous. Maybe they've been given a gift that you don't have. And maybe that's why they are doing things that you not, cannot do and maybe you're not supposed to do because they have different gifts. And the third reason why we cannot co conclude from our works to our faith is simply this. We're at different stages of our faith journey. Let me go back to the analogy of my kids. I cannot treat Abby, who is three, the same way I treat Anna, who is nearly nine. Anna is older and she has to behave better than a three-year-old. So, and in the same way, you cannot go to someone who is a Christian for two weeks and expect him to live a perfect life and to live a faithful life like someone who is a Christian for 20 years. A very young Christian simply cannot cope with that. He has to grow first, like small children have to grow. For children, there are age-appropriate behaviors. And for Christians, there are behaviors that might be appropriate for someone who is a Christian for six months, but maybe not for someone who has been a Christian for 20 years. And so we are on different journeys in our faith, and so we cannot simply say, like, okay, because you're doing this work, so now that's why you're a Christian, or no, you're, doing, you're not doing all these things, so you're a really bad Christian, or maybe not a Christian at all. The works that are evidence of our faith are different from person to person. And so we cannot simply compare our works with one another and then say, okay, if you meet that line, then you're a Christian. If you fail that line, then you're not a Christian. It doesn't work that way. Only God can judge that. Only God knows what is in, truly knows what is in our hearts. And only he can truly judge us by the evidence of our faith through our works. So in summary, works don't make us right with God. Only faith does. But works do confirm or disprove what we say we believe and whether we are truly Christians. So what can we do about this whole mess? In the end, we can only ask God that's the only thing we can do. 2 Corinthians 13 says, examine yourselves. It doesn't say examine each other. It says examine yourselves. 
Examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you are counterfeits. I cannot tell anybody whether he or she is saved. I can only bring the truth from the Bible to people. And whether you are saved, that's something you have to deal with God. No one else can tell you. And whether I am saved, no one else can tell me, but only God alone. Only the Holy Spirit can give us this assurance. Ephesians 1 says, In whom you also trusted after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you have believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. Who can tell you whether you are saved? Only the Holy Spirit can do that. No one else. One more verse that says the same, same thing, Romans 8. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Only the Holy Spirit can give us a promise. Only he can give us that assurance. No one else ever can. <coughs> so coming back to my original question, how do I know whether I'm saved? Like I said, I can't tell you. Only God can give you that, that assurance. If we've never gotten that assurance from him, we need to go to him. And we need to ask him. How do we do that? Of course, by prayer. Of course, by reading the Bible, what the Bible says, truly says, about what it means to be saved. Not just speaking a verse here and there, like, okay, so who... John 3.16, and taking that for face value. Yeah, John 3.16 is true, but we have to look at that verse in the context of the whole Bible and not taking that one just simply out of context. Asking God to give us that assurance. And then again, we need the community. We need the support. We need the prayers from one another because alone we will never get it. Without community... I don't believe it's possible because we will always believe the lies and the confusion that is out there in the world. So, do you think you are saved? Yes. <laughs> Good. If you say yes, where does that belief come from? Is it people who tell you something about God? Does it come from the Bible? Does it come from the Holy Spirit? Where does it come from? And how can we be sure that we are not one of those people in Matthew 7? The first group of people. The first verse that we looked at. How can we be sure that we are not one of those people where Jesus will say, I never knew you. You've done all church stuff. You've done all these right things. But your heart wasn't in it. How can we truly know that we are not one of those? There's only one way going to God individually in our quiet time on a consistent basis and letting him speak to us over and over again you're my child <clears throat> I love you you're safe I'll get you to heaven all those things only God can give us that assurance so let's all go deeper with God. Maybe some of us need to do some homework. Maybe some of us really need to de go deep with God to get that assurance. Maybe some of us do need a fresh revelation, a personal revelation from God about our identity and about who we truly are. God will give us that assurance. But we have to do our part. And we have to come to him. And we have to seek him. God is waiting. That's where the link is to the last two sermons. The parable of the two sons. God is waiting for all of us. <clears throat> the only question is, do we come home to him? 
And do we allow him to speak our true identity over us again and again and again? May we pray. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you didn't leave us alone. <clears throat> Jesus, you promised us when, before you left that if you leave, the Helper would come. If you leave, the Holy Spirit would, would come and testify about you, Jesus. You gave us a promise, and that is exactly what happened a few weeks after you have left the earth. And it is what is happening today. Your Holy Spirit is still here, still active and still speaking to all of us. Lord, we pray that today will be a day when you will speak to us in new ways. Maybe some of us have doubts. Maybe some of us have questions. Maybe some of us are confused. And maybe some of us have been relying on our works. We have been relying on being a good person and all these things, Lord, and trying to tell ourselves that we are right with God. And maybe some of us, we came to the conclusion today that maybe our lifestyle is telling us something differently. Maybe our lifestyle is telling us that we are not really right with you and that we are not really believing in you the way we say we believe. Lord, wherever we are, we pray that you will help us to come home today. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to us, not in condemnation, but simply in love and in conviction.